I've got uh, a, a great panel here for you, uh, put together by Nick and, and his team, as always. Um, some, uh, some folks I've been working with for a long time, so uh, hopefully this will be a, a, a free flow of ideas between everybody and, and, and not very rigid. Uh, feel free uh, to ask each other questions, challenge each other, um, or, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, correct some things or, uh, that you heard earlier during the day. Uh, to my immediate left is Tobias Backer. Um, he's at Fleetscape. Um, I've got Michael Kirk uh, and uh, Joe Cipolla and Steve Majeski. They've got uh, their bios in, um, in the program, so you guys can take a look quick at those if you want to. But I think I'll just kick this off again because we have a short period of time. And I think I'll start by just uh, asking everybody, starting with Tobias and, and, and working left, you know, what are you doing? What's, <laughs> what's keeping you busy? It's a good question. Uh, so Fleetscape is a, is a uh, shipping fund that's been set up by Oak Tree. Uh, it, it is a separate fund, but, but managed within the Oak Tree family of funds, if you will. We are a capital provider to shipping, so we're not going to go out and order 10 new buildings. Rather, we'll work with shipping companies to, to fill the capital gap in between owner's equity and bank debts. And uh, that can be in any kind of asset class, any, any part of the world. Uh, but we're basically the, uh, the, the, the creative source of alternative finance, if you will. Mike. Thanks. Um, RMK is a uh, broker dealer here in the U.S., so we do capital raising, both equity and debt, uh, M&A advisory, and general advisory to investors. Um, RMK Maritime, which is in both London and the U.S., focuses on sale leasebacks and first lien debt, including a lot of alternative lending. All right, Michael, thanks for having me here today. Uh, by way of introduction, Waffer Capital Partners is part of a diversified asset management platform, beneficially majority owned by the Public Institution for Social Security of Kuwait. We primarily focus on asset-backed and otherwise structured finance and have been active investors in shipping since around 2010. Our investments have spanned a variety of sectors, tankers, both dirty and clean, dry bulk and containers, and we're actively looking to grow our business. Uh, we invest across kind of the capital structure, but are credit-oriented uh, investors and therefore have tended more towards things like senior debt, sale leasebacks, mezzanine debt, preferred equity. Steve. Yes, thank you. Uh, Breakwater Capital is a company that was founded um, six years ago. And we are a team of shipping professionals with varied backgrounds. Um, you know, right now we have an exclusive partnership with a credit fund called Haven Capital that's based in the UK. It's about a $10 billion credit fund. And our primary activities relate to deploying capital related to two different types of investments we have. And one is a traditional senior debt model, uh, really trying to replicate uh, bank financing, but certainly, you know, filling the gap that um, senior lenders aren't able to, to lend at these days. And Secondly, we have more of a uh, strategic opportunities fund that allows us to invest deeper in the capital structure and when we see that the opportunities uh, present themselves. Thank you. Um, you know, we've heard a, a number of times, uh, twice so far up here already, and on a previous panel about uh, bridging the gap, and we heard uh, Francis of ABN say that that gap is large. Um, you know, so let's talk in specific terms rather than just kind of, you know, uh, vagaries of bridging the gap. Like, what, are, what are you going to do? I can't uh, look at you with these on. What are you, how are you helping to uh, bridge the gap? You know? um, okay, so you're a debt provider. Uh, Tobias, Michael, you're going you're, you're to bring uh, products to, uh, you know, to, to your clients. As Joe and Steven, same thing. But what, what, what is it? What exactly the products are you offering? I, I was kidding. It was Steven earlier that we're calling this the alternative uh, you know, finance panel. But I think for now, we'll just call it the finance panel, right? Because it's the only alternative. And uh, years ago, you would have seen a lot more bankers in this audience. And I've seen a lot more you know, alternative finance providers in this audience so far than I've seen bankers. And I think most, you know, left. I see Francis is the only one brave enough to stay. Um, so, uh, you know, w what exactly are you doing to bridge that gap? Well, I, I think you come to us for two reasons, uh, either because you have to or you want to. Uh, and I think uh, uh, if you take the first part, is very often we will come in, a, in a, uh, an amendment situation or a restructuring situation where there is a need for capital to come in to fix an underlying project problem. 
maybe there are new building orders that have been placed. Uh, on the, when those orders were placed, the owner assumed they were getting 80% finance, and you're a month away from delivery and you're only getting 50 or 60 from the banks. Uh, those kind of situations will step in and do a junior loan or will do a sell lease back or a preference share issue to, to fill the missing capital. Um, that's, um, you know, it's never good to, to have to, to invite somebody into to providing capital. So I think it's a fairly small portion of what we overall do. Most of, our, most of what we spend time on is to look at growth opportunities where uh, you just need different categories of capital. Uh, again, if the banks were providing 90% finance five years ago and they're providing 50 today, you just need different type of money to come in. And, uh, and, and you can call it many different things. You can call it equity or debt or pref. You, you, can, you can label it in many different ways. But we will come in and be creative and, and try to figure out how can you make, you know, how can you fill that gap with a capital that works within an industry that at the end of the day doesn't make a lot of running cash flow. So you need some creativity. You need to have some flexibility to realize you have to wait for the upturn to come and, and take advantage of a rising market. Mike, what are, you, what are you showing your clients? Yeah, I mean, for us, we don't necessarily have a set solution. Um, so really, it's working with the clients and figuring out what their needs are. But what I think we're really good at is being able to tell the client what's realistic. Um, because a lot of times, you might want a certain, amount of, certain type of capital at a certain price, and it might not be there. So we can pretty quickly steer people in the right direction. And we work with a number of different uh, funds and investors, including the guys up here, to help place that capital. Joe? Yeah, so maybe continuing on the theme, which I think was, was well put by Tobias, of you know, folks end up with us you know, whether they want, if they want to or potentially need to, just maybe to offer a couple of brief anecdotes. So, so more on the need to front, you know, we had a transaction some years back where an owner had several large container ships uh, being delivered on the basis of long-term contracts with one of the major liner companies. For the first vessel, they went to traditional bank finance. Second vessel, the Norwegian bond market. And at that point in time during that year, those sources of financing were tapped out for that owner and they found ourselves with us. And we provided a bridge solution that in essence uh, provided them a window of a couple of years uh, until they were able to arrange you know, longer term, as it happened, Chinese lease financing that kind of matched the duration of the long charter. So that's, I think, a situation where uh, we fulfilled the need, if you will. Uh, anecdotally also at present, we're talking with an owner who's looking, uh, putting on a play in the dry bulk space, and he's frankly comparing us, you know, uh, our solution to bank debt, and kind of seeing if, let's say, our, generally speaking, higher LTV and, you know, other flexible points offer an overall package that's better than, you know, kind of traditional 50%, you know, fairly rigid financing. So it really, it, 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 there are a lot of possible structures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Yeah, I think, I think the bank panel had an interesting discussion about you know, structural versus cyclical changes in the market. And you know, what was clear was the, the regulatory environment is redefining how banks approach the market. And as part of that process, I think banks need to look at their risk and do their risk assessments differently, because uh, there's certainly different pricing and risk uh, drivers, uh, especially as you look at Basel III and Basel IV. I think what we try to do is certainly underwrite risk in a different way than the banks do. Um, certainly looking at the markets, underwriting the market, underwriting the assets. Uh, we don't necessarily need a balance sheet to lend against or charters on the underlying vessels, but you know, make sure that we underwrite the risk that we view as being the key sources for repayment and providing capital on that basis. So one of the questions we talked about, Stephen, when we were going back and forth was, you know, how do you compete with traditional bank debt? Do you see yourself really as competing with traditional bank debt? Maybe that's where the term alternative is appropriate. Maybe we're not competing. Maybe you're not competing. No, I, I think that's a very good question. But I, as you know, they discussed in the bank panel, I think senior debt, traditional bank debt, is being redefined. Um, it's not like it was five or ten years ago. And it's being redefined as a low-risk, um, plain vanilla product um, that can meet the, the capital requirements of the regulators. And at the same time, you know, th there's, there's still an argument to be made um, that if you underwrite risk appropriately, um, you know, there are good deals um, in the marketplace. And there's a lot of ship owners that just don't have capital to the, don't have access to bank capital any further. 
Um, so we're really not competing uh, with senior debt, but really bridging that gap or, or providing, I hate to use the word alternative financing, but you know, there's, there's a whole new market out there, and if it's being filled by you know, credit funds or the bonds or leaseback products, um, there's a pretty big market out there that needs you know, set, a number of alternative credit providers. Uh, you, you see it differently, either one of you guys, or? No, I was just going to say, we, we cooperate with the banks more than we compete with the banks. I think <clears throat> the banks often come to us and say, we have this client, we love the client, but we just can't provide them with what they're asking for us for. Can you come in and, and be part of the solution? Uh, the ba senior banks are a very big source of deals for us. Yeah, I think it's really the same, the same market. I mean, we've seen it in almost every other sector with direct lending. Um, and shipping just historically takes a little bit longer than everybody else. Um, so I was reading an article about a month ago in Reuters talking about how there's some direct lending funds that are now lending to mushroom farms in Pennsylvania that are living, uh, lending to people's soccer stars' social media feeds. So you figure when people are lending to mushrooms and derivatives on Instagram, that means shipping's next. <laughs> Joe, what, what are some of the challenges faced by, you know, WAFRA and other alternative capital providers, particularly relating to borrowers that traditionally go to banks and, you know, maybe have been working with that bank generationally and say, you know, this is how we do business and, you know, they've got maybe a different model in mind than you guys are used to? Yeah, look, the, probably the number one challenge is we are looking for a high single digit running yield and that's before you kind of get into the specifics of the transaction. It, it, it's almost as simple as that, right? Are the cash flows there in the relevant industry, and are folks ready, willing, and able to pay? Right. That, that is by far and away the biggest challenge. Mike, when you're selling someone on a, on a different deal, you say, all right, you know, you've gone to the banks, that hasn't worked. You know, here are, the, uh, here are some alternatives. You know, what, what, what are they, what, what's their first reaction when they see perhaps a, uh, you know, an alter, a, a term sheet from Joe? Yeah, I mean, I, I think initially, you know, sometimes the, there's a little bit of sticker shock, but then you can just quickly kind of go through the numbers and, you know, if Joe's offering a little bit more leverage and you say, well, hey, your cost of equity is X, you know, this cost is Y, and they realize actually this looks pretty good. So sometimes it takes a little walking through, but um, people are getting it more quickly, and I think also there's just been a huge move uh, in the shipping industry where owners are really kind of getting up to speed, and um, it takes a lot less walking through and explaining than it did even a few years ago. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's been said here before, you know, you asked about competition from the, from the banks, and I'd say it's really uh, competition from the owner's own equity, right, as, as mm. Michael's kind of alluding to. And the banks, as Tobias mentioned, are frankly a source of deal flow and, and, and potentially leverage in the deals that we actually conclude. Tobias, Tobias what do you see as the biggest hurdle? You know, how much, also, you know, how much money do you guys have to, to put to work? Obviously, these banks don't have unlimited money anymore, but they tend to have more. Um, some take deposits, they have more money to put in, in uh, to work. You know, what do you see as the biggest challenge? I, I think for the right deals, the money will be there. Uh, and and uh, in terms of cost of capital, you, you, when you blend it with the cost of senior debts, the cost of capital isn't necessarily that bad. So you, you blend up somewhere between six and 10% overall cost of capital. And if the project doesn't justify that cost of capital, then you probably shouldn't do it in the first place. So, uh, and I think, going back to your point, Joe, uh, the, the most of the deals that we end up not doing is because the owner finds out this probably isn't something I should do. It's just not profitable enough, and therefore the deal falls apart. I think that uh, leads us nicely into the next question. Um, and uh, piggybacking a little bit off of uh, the last session, but uh, you know, we have an industry here where operating turns in most segments are soft, right? Um, and the rates you guys charge are higher than bank rates, right? That's why we're uh, up here. Um, so you know, can can the cash flow generated by these vessels support you know th these loans? Can can they actually pay you back? And I'll get us to our next question after this. But you know, uh, and, uh, and and maybe also just kind of throw in there, you know. Why shipping for you guys? I'll steal a question from Tony. I mean, uh, you know, we know it's in the bank's DNA, right? That's what they've told us. But for you guys, you have an option, right? Uh, you know, one, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, we see people move in and out of this industry, the folks who do this all the time, is that, 
you know, uh, private equity and the like tend to be industry agnostic, right? They, they're not shipping people per se, they move around. Um, and you guys have the ability to move around, so I guess the question is, why'd you pick shipping and why do you think they'll be able to pay you back? I'll start with you, Stephen. Well, I think the reason why we pick shipping is we're, we're shipping professionals. Um, most of our team has been in shipping for 20, 30 plus years. Um, so it's, it's an industry we've been part of for a very long time. And, you know, to be honest, you get to a certain age where you can't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as I said, you know, we're a team of seven people and the majority of us have worked at banks, at ship owners, um, brokers. So we have a pretty wide experience within the shipping space. Um, and being able to apply that, that expertise um, to what is, you know, capital that is not well informed about shipping and offshore, um, you know, to provide that expertise and, and, and show them the way to invest that capital in a strategic and smart manner um, is critical. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're still in shipping. Do you think they'll be able to pay you back the loans you're making? Obviously, you're making them for a reason. You're, well, I know all of you guys, right? And it's right. not—it's not loan to own, right? We're not buying up uh, junk no, debt, I, hoping to own it. So, what, what makes you think, with the the fluctuations in the market, that they're going to be able to pay you back? Well, there's every project or every company has a certain level of debt capacity, and and I think as Tobias noted, um, you need to make sure that you lend money within the debt capacity of the project. Um, you know, we we are one of the few direct lending funds in shipping today. Um, so we do have a much cheaper cost of capital than, than some of the other parties at this table. Um, but we underwrite it based on the debt capacity of the project and, and underwriting the risk that we think are, are keys to repayment. And you can't forget that you know, asset prices today are so much lower than they were five or 10 years ago. So lending at 50% on today's asset prices is much different than lending 80% on asset prices that were twice as high seven or eight years ago. So, you know, if you look through the market and you have a core investment thesis about the market uh, and the ship you're financing, um, you can create some flexible capital uh, to help a ship owner with, with traditional senior debt or alternative um, investment products. Joe? Yeah, look, our, our core mandate kind of is, has been, and we anticipate will be asset-based finance. Right? And so we, we moved into shipping around 2010 as part of just a strategic expansion of our core mandate. And as you do deals, and I'm sure many in this room can appreciate, you realize how much in one sense you don't know. Um, and to that end, we actually recently launched a platform um, earlier this year, Maritime Asset Partners, together with a group of Norwegian ship owners and financiers kind of dedicated to these alternative opportunities. So we still see a good risk-adjusted return uh, in the industry and are kind of committing additional resources to it. And Mike, as you said, and I mean, we expect to get repaid, just to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you said, I mean, people do have a choice, and I think given the yield compression in um, you know, the broader market uh, and other asset sectors, shipping is sort of the obvious next. And I think the risk risk adjusted returns in shipping right now mm -hmm. on debt are fantastic. And I think we will see more people come into the space, um, probably to the chagrin of the guys up here, but um, but there will be more because it's a pretty interesting place right now. Uh, Talking about Fleetscape, I mean, Fleetscape is a shipping fund. We raised $400 million. Uh, if we do well, I have no doubt we will raise more money. If we don't do well, if we don't get the money back, uh, we're not raising more money. It's quite simple. Uh, we invest in, in rela shipping relationship. We invest in the companies themselves, not in the, in the assets. Uh, that was talked a bit about on the former panel as well from a banking environment. That's, that's a bit of a change. Other other oak tree funds will invest in a different way, but we are a dedicated uh, capital source for the shipping industry and will remain so for the long term. Uh, we are a little bit different than some of our competitors. We don't need a running yield, so when you ask, do we, will, we get our, will we get our money back? Well, we do rely to some degree on, on asset values remaining where they are or where we expect them to be. Uh, so that is a bit of a bet on the market. Got it. Thank you. Um, one, uh, another point came up in the previous panel that I thought was interesting, and uh, you know, I think it was one of the sales points of the, of, of the you know the bank lenders that you know this is what they do. They're going to be here for the long term. They're going to work with you when times are bad. 
you know, and uh, I think goes to kind of my loan to own uh, statement before. Um, perhaps the implication being that you guys aren't, uh, but uh, I'd like to get a take on, uh, your take on, I, I have seen a lot of uh, restructuring myself over the last few years. I, I kid when people ask what kind of lawyer I am, I say I'm a restructuring lawyer now. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I'd like to get your take on it. And, and perhaps we can start with uh, Michael, and he can tell us. You know, have you been working th with any of your clients on restructurings who, who have the alternative finance providers uh, there, and how have they been to work with? Yeah, certainly. And I mean, it, it depends on who you're who you're talking to today. I mean, the, the, the guys up here obviously all know shipping quite well, um, and so that makes it easy. Sometimes you're lending to people that either don't know it or are trying to throw a bunch of things into a term sheet that just don't belong there, and then that gets more complex. So, you know, we tend to prefer to work with the guys that, that understand shipping and know it. Um, not sure I'm a huge believer in the, the long-term relationship thing. I mean, the ship owner is not going to take money from a guy that's more expensive, even if he's known him for a long time, and the lender is not going to lend money that's, you know, an inappropriate risk because it's, it's not there. And, you know, there are a lot of supposed long-term relationships that have completely gone away kind of through the crisis. So I think you, especially when you're talking about debt, if it's an equity thing that's a partnership, then the relationship's more important. When you're talking about debt financing, I'm not sure the, all else being equal, maybe the relationship's important, but otherwise I think you're probably trying to find the most efficient, cheapest cost of capital. I think that's probably the way it'll continue to be going forward. I think that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. I do know that uh, you know banks traditionally uh, you know have been uh, more hesitant to perhaps take write downs and maybe you know work with the, the borrowers to you know extend the loan so they don't have to perhaps take the loss this year or in a, in a particular quarter. Whereas you know uh, guys, the, the alternative finance guys, maybe with more of a, a, a uh, equities trader mentality, where you take your losses, you lick your wounds, and you move on. Um, and, you know, I just got, maybe Tobias should give us a little insight about, you know, flexibility that you guys have to work on uh, when you're working on loan that may be struggling a little bit, you know, cause, uh, because of the cyclical nature of what we do, right? It's not always going to be roses. If it's a, if it's a five year, it's a five year loan, you, you may hit a cycle or yeah, two. I, I think, you know, th if we get refinanced by a cheaper debt solution right, from a bank, things have got worked out well. And that's the ultimate goal for a lot of what we do. When we talk about relationship focus, when we talk to a client, we want to be a conversation partner. You know, this is the problem we're trying to solve. We don't exactly know how to solve it. Can you, Fleetscape, come in and be creative, come in and, 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 and address the funding need that we have? And long term, you want to be able to be refinanced by a bank and leave that situation uh, with, a, with a generally positive attitude. It uh, doesn't always work out that way, but that's the way we approach uh, the situations we go into. Uh, but, I, but I agree with you. If an owner should and always will look for the cheapest cost of capital if, uh, if, if, if that's available. So, Joe, I'm going to be more direct because I'm not sure I'm getting the answer I'm looking for. Um, if, uh, if, your, if your borrower breaches the coverage ratio, um, you know, are you going to work with them like the banks work with them? Well, I guess what I would say is, uh, I suppose it depends on which bank, right? We heard earlier there's some questions on, you know, who are you calling in certain institutions? Are they still there? Is it just a different, perhaps, culture or other things? We have a pretty flat hierarchy. You know, it's kind of one investment committee that oversees, you know, this asset-based and structured finance mandate. So I think the, the, the basic answer is it depends. If there's an economically rational thing to do, then we're all ears. Stephen. Yeah, no, I, I think certainly we, we all understand that market cycles are volatile and uh, certainly much shorter than they used to be. So I think going into a transaction, signing up for a five-year deal, you should expect some market volatility. Um, you know, we have had cases where, where there are covenant breaches um, and we work with our borrowers. You know, if it's a VMC breach, well, there's the VMC uh, requirement is there for a reason. So we expect to sit down and, and have a discussion about what they can do to improve our collateral position. Um, you know, whereas typically banks might waive them for six months and then waive them for another six months. And in the meantime, asset values continue to decline and next thing you know, you're underwater. Um, so I think we're, we're proactive uh, when it comes to those issues. We do work with our customers. Um, if that means repricing our risk, we'll, we'll, we'll consider that. Uh, but we are flexible and we do understand it is a um, it is a cyclical market, and you'll see cycles during the term of your financing. How do you generally 
price in that cyclicality and the volatility because uh, it can be extreme, as, as we all know. Um, and it, it's almost, you want to say, you know, your guess is as good as anybody's, but obviously that's not true because you're making money doing it. So how, how do you figure out how to price that in? I'm not sure if it's really a matter of pricing, but structure, right? Um, the more volatile the asset class is or the specific transaction, the lower the loan to value is. Because ultimately, it's your collateral that's going to get repaid um, if you have problems. So it's really adjusting the terms, um, your loan to value, covenants, et cetera. Um, you, there might be some element of pricing, but again, I think the terms and structure are more important to mitigate that risk. Joe, is that how you guys approach it? Yeah, I think at a high level, I think, you know, there are some specific tools besides, you know, loan to value. Um, again, given some of the return profile we look at, you know, we often get into conversations about different forms of either equity kickers or uh, given, you know, certain elements of the volatility situations where we look to de-risk through fluctuations uh, in the market, right? Maybe looking at different forms of cash sweeps depending on underlying earnings and things of that nature. So there is, frankly, a lot of different structural elements as well as pricing elements, I think, that can go into the mix. Mike, when you're, you're shaking your head affirmatively, no, no, is, no, is no, it structuring? Yeah, is that's that exactly it? right. And that's the, the typical stuff we'll see. Yeah. Tobias. And, and the, the main focus for us is, is the company able to pay their operating costs? Are they, are they able to keep the banks happy? If they can do those two things, uh, then we can be fairly flexible in pricing and structure. All right. The uh, a question, uh, every, every time I see a new story about one of these Chinese leases or, you know, I see something that I get done in the market, I'm just shaking my head wondering how this is all going to pan out for them and, uh, you know, do folks actually know what they're getting into. But, you know, I look at the advance rates and I look at the cost of capital and I say, wow, this is amazing and you can't blame a ship owner for doing it, right? They're going to get 100%, 105% of the value of their ship, um, you know. So I guess my question for, for you guys is, how is that going to work out for them? And two, probably more importantly for us, you know, how, how do you compete with what sometimes seems to be, you know, irrational, uh, uh, you know, practices? Tobias? Well, first of all, you don't compete. It's a different product. Uh, and, um, and I will say to you, any ship owner, if you can raise 100% capital somewhere for 5% you know, cost of capital, you should absolutely do it. You shouldn't be wasting your time talking to me. Um, there, there's no, uh, you know, every time in shipping we talk, talk about this funding gap that's not going to be filled, and then some new cap, capital source comes in, whether it was the Norwegian KS market or the German KG market or the Norwegian bond market or the private equity boom we had. This money coming out of leasing houses in Asia is no different. It's, it's a lot of money coming in very quickly out of nowhere. It's going, to, it's going to wind down, and there will be a new source of capital that's going to come. And um, I can't tell you from where. And, uh, and that will be good for the industry. It will fill a gap that's not there. And, but throughout all of this, there is a space that needs to be filled by alternative capital. Uh, I'll sitting here on the panel. And, and, um, and that, will, that, will, that space will remain regardless of who else is coming in. Michael, you've got a client in front of you trying to help them with their funding needs. You know, Joe, Stephen, and uh, Tobias are willing to lend them money, and you've got the Chinese leasing sure. company. What do, what do you tell them? Well, at this point, I think there's enough of a gap where, you know, if you can raise Chinese leasing and you have an ability to do so, you're probably not having the conversations with these guys anyway. Because um, it, it tends to be more corporate clients that are able to raise that, that Chinese leasing. I mean, it's cheap capital. It, it's not indiscriminate capital. I mean, they do, you know, we, we do a lot o over there. And they do look at they do look at risk. They do, you know, ask questions. They're not just giving the money away. It's become more competitive, and that's really amongst themselves, um, and that's driven pricing down. Um, but it's not, you know, as straightforward as, as it may seem to get. Um, and so that, you know, that, that's a sort of a different borrower universe. That's a borrower universe that, that Chinese leasing is competing against sort of the traditional banks. I'd say. See it this act, Stephen. I see you shaking your head. You, see, you don't see them as competitors. No, I fully agree. It's it's more competition with the the traditional commercial banks. I think. Excellent. 
All right, we, we've got about five minutes left, and uh, I figure we use this time for you guys to sell your wares and you know tell folks you know what kind of deals you're going what you're willing to do, what your parameters are. You know, if, if you'd like, I can be uh, you know just keep grinding out the questions. But uh, I, I know there are a lot of owners out there, and they want to know what it takes to get a loan from from you guys. Um, and Michael, you can tell us generally what what it is f folks are uh, seeing out there. Tobias, you know, what what do folks uh, you know, what can folks expect to see, you know, with respect to term, you know, whether or not there's a call, you know, uh, you know, loan to value, what, you know, what is it? Uh, well, I would say each deal that we do is, is very different from, from the other. Uh, however, the, the, so the base transaction is effectively a sale lease spec transaction, five to eight years, and we'll have call options from years three through seven. That's typically the, the, the structure we look at. Uh, what ends up happening is if, if you start a conversation about, uh, about, the, about the project that the client wants to complete, there'll always be some kind of twist or change. So maybe you end up doing a loan instead of a lease, or maybe you end up doing preferred equity instead. Uh, but yes, the base product is sort of a five to eight year sale lease back. Michael. So again, for us, it's hard to necessarily point to it typical structure since we've invested, you know, anything from senior loans to preferred equity to sale leasebacks. Some common threads uh, throughout, though, have been we are typically looking at a five-year term overall in terms of the realization, you know, deployment and realization of, of the investment. Uh, in some way, shape, or form, we are looking to get to, you know, call it a high single-digit return, a lot of different ways to do that, and depending on the risk, might be seeking, seeking more than that. Um, you know, LTV or implied LTVs, you know, have ranged pretty significantly from, call it 65 to somewhere in the vicinity of 90 to 95% in the context of sale leaseback transactions, just to give some broad parameters. Steve? Yes, um, you know, within the last five years, we've, we've um, invested, you know, in excess of $1.2 billion in the, call it the, the alternative finance space or alternative capital space. Uh, typically, within our direct lending fund, you know, it's seven and a half to eight percent type capital. It's five-year money. Um, you know, we generally look at standard covenant packages you'd see in a bank facility, uh, with you know a couple of additional provisions. For example, prepayment penalties. Um, certainly, we're we're lending when the market is is pretty illiquid for alternative sources, and, and we would expect some form of repayment penalties to be included. That might be a little different than what a bank would require. Um, but on that, it's it's pretty much consistent with what you might otherwise see from a from a bank facility, but just the the added element of our risk underwriting and our structure might be a little different. And then I, I think just generally, there's 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 typically a flavor of the month um, in terms of structures, um, but also in terms of sectors. So you know, it's it's good to to be able to look at a broad range of solutions because it may be that hey. X fund here that likes to do MES is really into the you know, feeder container space today. Or this fund that really likes to do stretch senior really likes Affirmaxes. And so, you know, it's good to kind of uh, be aware of what's out there in the market because it's not, uh, it changes pretty, pretty frequently and, uh, and there's not sort of a set market structure. Guys do play on the fringes and just get an idea that, hey, my fund really likes this sector and so they'll do things that are a little bit more interesting within what they're focused on at the moment. That's a, uh, a good final question, I guess. Tobias, are, are you sector agnostic, or uh, you know, are there things that you just, uh, you know, I don't want to say won't touch, but uh, you know, that you'd shy away from? I mean, there per personally, there are certain sectors I like better than others, uh, but that doesn't mean that we will shy away from them. Uh, we are very focused on who the counterparty is, and is there a, is there a sound underlying business that? that uh, justifies what, what they're doing. What, does this company deserve to exist? <laughs> uh, when, I, when I started in this industry, the first deal I ever did was for a pipeline barge, which is literally the worst asset you can own as, a, as an equity investor, because if it comes off lease and you get in your lap, there's nothing else you can do with it. Uh, but again, that's the first deal I ever did, and we were, we were very happy about it. <laughs> Joe? Yeah, so we... I guess I would say we are sector agnostic, right? No one in our office is sitting around surveying the market and saying, you know, we need to be in tankers now or bulkers or whatever else. We're really trying to find kind of best-in-class owners 
um, with track records of managing whatever that asset is successfully through different market cycles and setting up structures where we feel like there's a good incentive alignment between the owner and us. That's really how we approach the business. And the need for that current cash pay, of course, can be limiting in certain sectors, right, where it's just not there. Um, yeah. Which has perhaps kept us out of certain opportunities and, you know, away from from some sectors at certain times where uh, we're pretty glad we're not there right now. <laughs> Stephen, we'll finish up. No, I think certainly we, um, you know, follow the market cycles closely and really look at our entry point and that helps to drive both whether or not we want to invest in that type of asset at that time and if we do, the type of capital that we would invest. Um, so it's really a matter of, of understanding your entry point and also understanding uh, your potential exit and making sure that you're investing in and somewhat liquid uh, asset classes. You know, there's, there's a lot of asset classes or asset types within shipping that are, can be very illiquid at times. And, you know, so you certainly don't want to find yourself holding one of those um, in, in, a, uh, in a distressed situation. All right. Well, our time's up. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.